Once again, a very good morning to all of you. It's nice to see all of you in the house of the Lord. And as we prepare our hearts and as we quieten our hearts to be receptive to the move of the Holy Spirit, let's just listen to the words of the psalmist in Psalm 36. Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens. Your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mountains of God. Your judgment are like the great deep. Men and beasts you save, O Lord. How precious is your steadfast love, O God. The children of mankind take refuge in the shadow of your wings. The feast, they feast on the abundance of your house and give them drink from the river of your delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light do we see light. Let's just turn our eyes to our Lord and God. Dear Heavenly Father, we indeed want to acknowledge your steadfast love towards us. You never leave us wanting, Lord. You take care of all our needs. Open our hearts to hear your word, to digest it, Lord, and let it transform our lives. Open our lips to worship you, and let our worship be acceptable to you, O Lord. So, Lord, we just want to commit our thoughts and our prayers and our words and our worship to you, Lord. Speak to us. For we, your servants, your children, wait upon you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. And the Lord be with you. Let's pray together. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. The first commandment is this. The Lord our God is the only Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And the second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Together. Amen. Lord, have mercy upon us and write all these laws in our hearts. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, to be our advocate in heaven and to bring us to eternal life. Let us now, on our knees, or sitting as we can, let us confess our sins in penitence and faith firmly resolve to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace with all men. Let's just quieten our hearts, turn our thoughts to our Saviour. Seek forgiveness for the things that we have done which will hurt Him and things that we have not done which He has commanded us. Together, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our fellow men in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. 
For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. So receive God's grace and his forgiveness. May Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Isn't it great to be the forgiven people of God? Amen. Amen. Let's rise to say together the Gloria in Excelsis. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, Heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks. We praise you for your glory. Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ. In in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Amen. Let's now worship the Lord together, led by our brother Leroy and our sister Naomi. Hallelujah. Let's give him your praise this morning. Hallelujah. Go. I'm casting my cares aside. I'm leaving my past behind. Setting my heart and mind on you, Jesus. I'm reaching my hands to yours, believing there's so much more. Knowing that all you have in store for me is good, it's good. Today is the day you have me. Rejoice and be glad in it. Today is the day you have made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. I won't worry about tomorrow. I'm trusting in what you say. Today is the day. Today is the day. I'm putting my fears aside. Doubts behind. I'm giving my hopes and dreams to you, Jesus. I'm reaching my hands to yours, believing in so much more. Knowing that all you have in store for me is good. It's good. Today is the day. Trusting in what you say, today is the day, today is the day, oh, oh. I will stand upon your truth, let's declare it, I will stand upon your truth, and all my days I live for you, all my days I live for you, oh, and I will stand on your truth, and all my days I live for you. Today's the day you have made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Today's the day you have made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. I'm giving you my fears and sorrows Where you lead me, I will follow 
I'm trusting in what you say. Today is the day. Today is the day. Hallelujah, you have made us glad. Hallelujah. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit, Lord, we come. We're gathered together to lift up your name, to call on our Savior. Fall on your grave. Let's sing it again. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit, Lord, we come. We're gathered together to lift up your name, to call on our Savior, to fall on Save 
You are a God who is mighty to save a God. Hallelujah. And so Lord, we come and we fall on your grace. We, we trust totally in you, wholly in you, O God. For you have called us to be your very own. We thank you, Lord, that you are the one who first loved us. So let our songs this morning just be a reflection of that, a response, God, of our love back to you, God. Let's lift our hearts to him, church, just where you are, where you are. Just tell him how much he means to you, how much you, can, you love him, how much that we have to give all for his sake. Lord, we give our lives to you. Let's just respond with this song. My Jesus, I love you. I know thou art mine. I will be all the follies of sin.
Indeed, Lord Jesus, we love you. We love you with all our lives until we come into your presence, Lord. Amen. Amen. Even as we remain in a mood of prayer and worship, let's pray together the collect for the 19th Sunday after Trinity. Together, Almighty God, your Son has opened for us a new and living way into your presence. Give us pure hearts and steadfast wills to worship you in spirit and in truth. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please be seated as our sister Dolly brings the first reading. The first reading is taken from Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34, and Jeremiah chapter 33, verses 14 through 16. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand, to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Jeremiah chapter 33, verses 14 through 16. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will dwell securely. And this is the name by which it will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to stand for the reading of the gospel. The gospel according to Luke chapter 22 and beginning at verse 14. Glory to Christ our Saviour. Luke chapter 22, verses 14 to 20. And when the hour came, he reclined at table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. This is the gospel of Christ. Praise, Praise to Christ our Lord. Would you bow your hearts with me in prayer? Father, we come before you, before your holy word. Come, Lord, and speak. Open our hearts, open our ears, and open our spiritual eyes to behold you the King of glory, and that beholding you and hearing your word, we may walk in obedience. 
In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you please be seated? Viktor Frankl was a Holocaust survivor, and in 1946, he wrote this book, Man's Search for Meaning. And the subtitle is in smaller print. I read it for you. The classic tribute to hope from the Holocaust. The classic tribute to hope from the Holocaust. And his central thesis was, a person needs meaning in order to survive the harsh realities of life, and especially life in a concentration camp. And he gives various examples of how different ones that he saw derived meaning and he gave them strength. So one example he gave was having a, someone that you love and thinking about that person and thinking about meeting that person after the war. And so that, to him, was some of the experiences in terms of psychotherapy of what enables a person to survive the harsh realities. Friends, today as we look at this whole topic of hope, in biblical hope, we have hope that far surpasses all the examples that Viktor Frankl can give because we have a hope that goes beyond this life into eternity. Amen? Amen? We have a God of the new covenant. We have hope in Jesus Christ who has overcome death. And so the topic today is, are you hopeful in an amazing God? The God of the new covenant. And we are coming today, especially in a week where war has broken out in Israel. Where is our hope? In times of war, in times of crisis, our hope and our eyes are on our Creator God who loves us and who cares for each one of us. So friends, we come today to the closing uh, sermon of our series on the book of Jeremiah. And we've been on the book of Jeremiah all the way from July. So it's been a few months. If someone were to ask you, you know, maybe in the office, huh? Uh, brother in Christ or whatever, were to ask you, so you've been on this series of Jeremiah, what is the central message of the book of Jeremiah? In two or three sentences, uh, not, don't give him an essay, right? How would you, in two or three sentences, describe the central message of the book of Jeremiah? I think for me it's captured in Jeremiah's call. All the way, you know, right from the beginning in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 10. See, I have set you this day over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to break down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. You have six verbs there. Four are negative. Four are concerning judgment, right? Pluck up, break down, destroy, overthrow. But it ends with hope, salvation, to build and to plant. So these two aspects of God's judgment. If man does not listen to God's warnings, has Jeremiah, for 40 years he preached this message. Repent, turn from your evil ways. If not, the Babylonians will destroy you. This temple that you put your hope in will be totally destroyed. For 40 years, Jeremiah preached this message of pluck up, break down, destroy, and to overthrow. But we see even in those chapters that we have covered, there have been glimmers of hope. But today, we come to the very center of the book of Jeremiah. Isn't it interesting that we finish the book of Jeremiah in the center of the book? Because that, friends, is the central message of the book of Jeremiah, that well, that judgment is not the last word. That there is hope and salvation that God desires and that God has planned and God has made a way. So right at the beginning, we had this structure. And I think it's important to, to keep this structure in mind because Jeremiah is not an easy book. It is not chronological. It is theological. So it's put together to 
convey this central message that I just spoke to you about. And so we close the book of Jeremiah here in Jeremiah 30, 31, verses 31 to 34. But it is in the central part of the book, the oracles of consolation and hope. And it's these four chapters. And friends, in the past week or so, I've been in these four chapters. And I tell you, it transports you into the very presence of God, into the very heart of God. And so I do encourage you to know the structure, and I pray that as you know the structure, it will help you as you yourself go through. 52 chapters, it can be quite daunting, but if you have this structure, you can see the parallels, right? A1, A2, the, the prologue and the epilogue. And then it's the sandwich, right? B1 and B2, the oracles of judgment. And many of our sermons was actually from chapter 2 to 25. And then you have C1 and C2, the narratives, um, first in 26 to 29, deciding be between prophetic visions. And then 34 to 45, wicked leaders and the fall of Jerusalem. But right here in the center, the oracles of of consolation and hope. So friends, are you hopeful in an amazing God, the God of the new covenant? And a central message for the book, I, asked you, I told you if there's two sentences, here's the summary by Bishop Rennes. Primarily of the central section of the book, but of the, the book as a whole. Beyond the dandere in life is hope. Hope is the certainty of a better future because the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. Nadir is the word that means the lowest point in our life. The nadir in life is the lowest point in our life. And so beyond the lowest point in our life is hope. And this hope is not, when we say, you know, I hope I can do this, it's not wishful. It is biblical hope is certainty of a better future because the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. And that's the psalm that uh, Brother Ben read, focusing on the steadfast love of the Lord. His love never ceases. Friends, if you were one of the exiles, being marched off in chains from Jerusalem by the Babylonians in 586 BC. Can you imagine the emotions in your mind? Jerusalem is destroyed. The temple, which signified the very presence of God, is totally destroyed. You remember we spoke about how Judah, knowing that Israel... 100 plus years earlier in 722 BC was destroyed by the Assyrians. But they had confidence, we are in Jerusalem. We have the temple. Surely God will defend us. Surely God is with us. They put their confidence in themselves and in the place and in the temple. But their hearts were was far from God. They were living in disobedience and in spiritual adultery. And so as they are marching now away, all that Jeremiah had prophesied had come true. Jerusalem is destroyed. The temple is totally demolished. So to their homes. And they are marching in chains to go 700 miles away. in their hearts and in their minds, they are saying, is there a future? Has God abandoned us? And the answer in the book of Jeremiah is in this section, this section chapter 30 to 33. There is a hope and a future because God is the God of the new covenant. And he makes a way. And that, my friends, is the central message of this book. 
And so, has the, peop has the people marched to Babylon? There is a group that remains in Jerusalem. They are the poorest. And Jeremiah is actually one of those being marched to Babylon. But because Nebuchadnezzar is kind to Jeremiah, he sends word to the chief guard to say, take Jeremiah, look after him well, and do him no harm, but deal with him as he pleases you. And so Jeremiah is released from his chains, and the chief guard asks him, do you want to go to Babylon? And Nebuchadnezzar says, you'll be treated well. Or do you want to stay in Jerusalem? And he chooses to stay in Jerusalem. And we find that the people in Jerusalem and in Judah come to Jeremiah and say, tell us now what we are to do. And so they came to Jeremiah and asked him to pray to God for them and for God to show them the way they should go and what they should do. So I'm speaking about those who remained in Jerusalem. And so Jeremiah, after 10 days, goes to them and says, Remain in the land, and in particular, do not go to Egypt. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Jeremiah 42. Jeremiah 42, I'm at verse 15 and 16. Then hear the word of the Lord, O remnant of Judah. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, if you set your faces to enter Egypt and go to live there, then the sword that you fear shall overtake you there in the land of Egypt, and the famine of which you are afraid shall follow close after you to Egypt, and there you shall die. So the word is very clear. Stay in Jerusalem. God will enable the king of Babylon to have favor upon you. But do not go to Egypt. Because the temptation always for the people of Israel is to run. When there's a one power, they, they'll go and take refuge in another power. That's how they show their faithlessness, you see. And so Jeremiah is warning them. They came to ask him what to do and he tells them. Now what do they say to him? Chapter 43, verse 2. Azariah, the son of Hashiah, and Johanan, the son of Kareah, and all the insolent men said to Jeremiah, You are telling a lie. The Lord our God did not send you to say, Do not go to Egypt to live there. Can you imagine these people? All that Jeremiah had said had come true. Babylon has destroyed Jerusalem. They have... They are now in Jerusalem. Many have gone to Babylon. The poorest stay in Jerusalem. And they ask Jeremiah, what shall we do? Jeremiah tells them, stay in Jerusalem. Don't go to Egypt. But they have the audacity and the hardness of heart to disobey. And friends, I recount this in chapter 42, 43, because it's after Babylon has destroyed Jerusalem to tell you there is the need for the new covenant because of the hardness of the human heart. And before we are too quick to say, these people of Jerusalem, will they ever learn? Will we look at our own lives? That when we too have gone away from God and have faced His discipline and His judgment, Will we, unlike the people who remain in Jerusalem, turn and follow and be obedient to the Word of God? And so, friends, that's why there is this need for the new covenant. And so, Jeremiah chapter 30 focuses on the restoration to the land. But there's no point to return to the land if there's no change of heart. Because the whole cycle will happen again, right? So restoration is not just to the land, but a changing of the human heart. And so 
may help you to remember, Jeremiah 30 focuses on the promise of the restoration to the land, which Jeremiah had all along said, right? 70 years and I'll bring you back. And so that's hope. Hope that this exile is not short, not unlike the false prophets who were saying two years, it's going to be 70 years. So get married, build homes, look after the welfare of God in the city that you're in, in Babylon. But after 70 years, I'll bring you back. But that's restoration to the land. What's more crucial, what's more vital is the restoration of the human heart. And here in Jeremiah, Jeremiah 31, particularly in the verses that we read, was read, is this call for a new heart, a new covenant that God makes a way and He establishes a new covenant for the people of God that the days are coming when I will declare a new, I will make a new covenant. So, if you turn to Jeremiah 31, verses 31 and 32. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. A biblical covenant is a relationship or bond between God and His people. And it is captured by the refrain that we come across in Scripture, You shall be my people and I will be your God. So a covenant, covenant is a bond, a relationship between God and His people. And God here in this uh, passage makes the contrast between the old covenant which the people broke and the new covenant that he will make. And he says, this new covenant will not be like the old covenant that God made with Israel when he brought them out of Egypt at Mount Sinai. The problem with the old covenant is that it, it was broken. The people could not keep God's law. God's law, which was meant to show them how they were to be the, the people of God. But they failed again and again. And even at the point when they received the old covenant with the Ten Commandments, what happened when Moses came down Mount Sinai? Worship of the golden calf. We would say even before the ink could dry, the people had disobeyed and were in idolatry the idol with the golden calf. And so, symbolically, the old covenant was broken. And time and time again in Israel's history, they broke God's covenant. But we praise God for the new covenant which is better. The new covenant which is better. Friends, this passage in Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 34, is the longest Old Testament passage quoted in the New Testament. It is the longest Old Testament passage quoted in the New Testament. And if you turn in Hebrews 8, you will find it there. So in Hebrews 8, you find it on verse, verses 8 to 12. 8 to 12. The whole passage from Jeremiah 31 is re repeated here. But in the context of chapter 8, the better is actually from verse 6. So I read for you. But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old, as the covenant he mediates is better, since it is enacted on better promises. So this new covenant that God will make, will be inaugurated by Jesus Christ, who is the mediator of this new covenant, which is better. And what I want to speak to you now is three reasons why it is better. It is better because there is inward transformation of the heart. Verse 33, 
For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Can you see the, the, the covenant, um, the desire of God's covenant is that I will be their God and they will be my people. And so the people broke, kept breaking God's law, the old covenant. And so God says, I will bring about an inner transformation of your heart. I'm not going to change the law. That's why Jesus said, I did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. So God doesn't change the law, but He changes the capacity of the human heart to follow God's law. The new covenant is about God enabling us to have the capacity to follow His law because He writes His law in our hearts. There is this inward transformation of the heart. Now, how is this established in the new covenant? Two things. The death and resurrection of Christ and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It's the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit now poured into our heart that it indwells each and every one of us. That God has given us the power and the enabling to follow His law and to obey Him. So the inward transformation of the heart. Second, it's intimate knowledge of God. Verse 34. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. The Holy Spirit now, dwelling in our hearts, testifies of Christ. That's why Jesus says, it is better that I go, because when I go, I will send the counselor, and he will reveal all things to you. And so we have this intimate knowledge and relationship. It's not just cognitive, but it's knowing the Lord. Having His heart. And you know, in Scripture, when it speaks about knowing God, it's about acting justly, doing right, caring for the poor and the needy. And Jeremiah himself will say this. Jeremiah 22, verse 16. He, judge, he, referring to King Josiah, judged the cause of the poor and needy. Then it was well. Is not this to know me, declares the Lord. To know the Lord is not just to know Him in our mind. It is to do. It is to care for the poor and the needy. Jeremiah 22, verse 16. The other thing that we see in this passage in Jeremiah 31 about intimate knowledge of God is that it is not just individual, it is collective, right? It is the whole community of God's people. For they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest. God is building and making a new society. And so St. Paul's Church has we, the people of God. It's not just an individual intimacy with God. It is a corporate coming together. And that as we know Him, the light of Christ, the hope of the world, that many will be drawn to Him, to know Him and to love Him. Thirdly, complete forgiveness from God. Verse 34. The last part of verse 34. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. How were the people forgiven in the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament? Through animal sacrifice. The people bring a lamb, give it to the priest, the priest offers it. We who are in the new covenant, Jesus has done it all. One perfect sacrifice 
on the cross to take away the sin of the world. And so God has broken the cycle of sin and punishment through Christ. Now, we need to ask, what horizon are we in? Do we, is our heart fully transformed? Do we have perfect knowledge of God? We still need forgiveness. And so, it's important for us to know that the new covenant has been inaugurated, but we await for it to be consummated. So the kingdom is now and not yet. The prophecies are fulfilled, but not exhausted. That's another way of saying it. So in prophetic literature, we have to be cognizant, mindful of the time horizon. And so I've been helped by Christopher Wright in understanding three horizons of prophetic fulfillment. The first horizon is in the horizon of the immediate historical context. So it's the horizon of the Old Testament. And so in the book of Jeremiah, it is, the fulfillment is in the actual return of the exiles after 70 years of captivity. What is the second horizon? It's the horizon of the New Testament. With the coming of Christ, the new covenant has begun. The Holy Spirit has been poured out. But we await its consummation. The horizon of Christ's return and the new creation and the consummation of God's new covenant. And you know, the second passage that was read for us from Jeremiah 34 highlights these three aspects. So in Jeremiah 33, we read in verse 15, in those days, and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will dwell securely. And this is the name by which it will be called, The Lord is our righteousness. So this is written about 600 BC. When is this fulfilled? In Horizon 1 in the context of the Old Testament. It's fulfilled by Zerubbabel, who is a son of David, from the line of David, who, when we read the book of Ezra, is the governor who leads the people back, the first exiles back, the first wave of exile, after King Cyrus of Persia had issued the edict in 539 BC. 70 years after um, God's judgment, the first exiles come back. So this righteous branch in the horizon one is referring to Zerubbabel. But we know it's ultimately fulfilled in Christ, who is the righteous branch, who is the Davidic ruler who will execute justice and righteousness, who comes. But then it says, in those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will dwell securely. Now, where is this? You look at the Middle East now, you look at Israel now, it's in turmoil. It's pointing, my friends, to Horizon 3, to the consummation, to when Christ comes again. And there will be no more death, no more wars, no more tears, no more sin. That we will be with the Lord. And so, these three aspects of the new covenant, which makes it better. It has come, but it is not exhausted. This human heart still needs molding, right? We, we talked about God is the potter, we are the clay. He's not finished with us. We still disobey. That's why we have confession, we have absolution. Because on this side of eternity, we will continue to sin. But God has given us by His Spirit the enabling to grow from one degree of glory to another, to become more and more and more like Christ. That's the call from Holy Scripture until we see Him face to face. Then we will have the full knowledge of Him. 
The Holy Spirit enables us to have this knowledge of Him that we, will, we know Him, but we don't know Him fully. 1 Corinthians tells us, right? Now I see dimly, but then I will see face to face. Now I know in part, then I will... So this moving from horizon 1 to horizon 2 to horizon 3 has helped me tremendously in reading prophetic literature, whether it's Daniel, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, any of the prophetic books. I pray you have this timeline. The people in exile were looking to the Davidic king. They were looking for Christ to come. We, on this side of the cross, are looking to His coming again. We are filled with glorious hope. Because we are in between horizon 2 and horizon 3. And so as we read the scriptures, particularly Revelations 21 and 22, will it just transform your mind? That in whatever circumstance or situation you're in, we are certain of a better future in Christ Jesus our Lord. And this covenant is an everlasting covenant. It's an everlasting covenant. It's there in Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 40. It's everlasting, my friends, because it's enacted between God the Father and God the Son. God the Son, who on our behalf died on the cross. Jesus has done it on the cross. And that's why it's a covenant that cannot be broken because it doesn't depend on us. We appropriate by it by faith in what Christ has done. That's why it is an everlasting covenant. Soon we will come to the Lord's table. We will partake of the bread and the wine. And the gospel passage that was read was from Luke chapter 22. I read to you Luke chapter 22 and verse 20. And likewise the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Jesus, the words of Jesus, has he partook of the Last Supper with his disciples. It is through the blood of Jesus, one perfect sacrifice, that you and I enter into the promises of this glorious new covenant. And that's why we can say, beyond the nadir in life is hope. Hope is the certainty of a better future because the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. Friends, some of you may have gone through very dark, Places in your life where you felt totally abandoned, totally distraught, and you've experienced God's grace and God's love. Some of you today are perhaps at a low point in your life. because of things you have done or because of circumstances beyond your control. The Word of God today and from the book of Jeremiah is beyond the nadir, beyond the lowest experience of your life. There is hope. Hope is the certainty of a better future because the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. Will you bow your hearts with me in prayer? Gracious God and Father, we thank you for the word. We thank you for the book of Jeremiah. We pray that, Lord, you will help us to be like him, to go against wind and tide, to be robust, to be resilient, 
to be obedient to your call, to be a prophet to the nations. Brothers and sisters, as you have heard God's word, what is God's call upon your life? Will you walk in obedience to the word of God and to the prompting of the Holy Spirit and to turn from all that is not right and to walk in holiness and in obedience to Him. And for those of you who are going through tough times, put your hope in the Lord. He loves you with an everlasting love. The power of His love knows no bounds. He loved you and with open arms he died on the cross to save you to give you life life in all its fullness and amidst all that you go through he is the light and he's shining bright walk in that light and in the hope he has made for you in Christ our Lord and our King. All this we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Shall we stand as we respond with this song, The Power of His Love. Yeah. Mm-hmm.
Amen. Amen. Even as we have heard the word of God and we are reminded that we can look forward to the day when Jesus Christ comes again, let us together declare our belief in the words of the Nicene Creed. Together, we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and of earth all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from God, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven by the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate of the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sin. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Before we do the announcements, uh, let me just welcome those who are here for the first time. I know that there are some visitors there, our three young people. Would you like to stand so that we can see you? Thank you. Any, anyone else? Okay. Um, once again, uh, just a reminder that uh, after service, we have breakfast fellowship. So please join us for breakfast fellowship so that we can get to know you better. Um, today I have a couple of announcements. First, uh, the Hebrew appreciation course. Uh, just a reminder from last week's announcement, the course will start in the month of November the 4th, Sundays in November from 11 to 12.30 p.m. Uh, Mr. Clarence Fong, where's Clarence? Oh, Clarence, ah, there, Clarence. So anyone who have any questions about the course, please approach Clarence. And also, if you want to sign up, uh, the, his telephone number, I think, is there. Uh, please contact Clarence. Thanks. Next. Uh, okay, uh, I thought I'd make a quick announcement to remind you all that the celebration of Christmas 2023 will be on Saturday, the 16th of December, we will have a service, service of carols and lessons here at about 5.30 to 7, and then we will adjourn to the hall for dinner. This year, dinner will not be ticketed, so uh, please, uh, you know, it will be uh, nice to join in fellowship. So think about the people that you want to invite uh, to join in the Christmas celebration. We'll have more information as the day draws closer. Okay? And then one final announcement <clears throat> is about communion. Uh, so please, uh, we are back to normal communion practice. Uh, wait for the ushers to release you from your rows to come forward. Unless you have a very special reason you need to rush off somewhere. But otherwise, wait for the ushers to release you uh, and then you come forward. So this row and this row sort of gravitate towards this side of the aisle, and this row and that row gravitate towards this side. But on the day that there is choir, be patient, let the choir go quickly first, okay, so that they can come back and lead us in worship. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> now I'll call Shin Yong to lead us in intercession.
Shall we pray? We want to pray for the church and the world. Almighty God, we pray for the people of Israel and Palestine, affected by the war, conflict in Gaza and Israel, loss of lives, displacing families, destroying homes, both Israelis and Palestinians. We pray and intercede for healing against hatred, restoration and peace to the deteriorating crisis. We pray for de-escalation as the Israeli troops are preparing for the ground offensive in Gaza. We pray for the supply of food, medical aid, finance, shelters and a safe passage for civilians. Defend, O oh Lord, those who are defenseless. And that we pray for the international community will contribute to the de-escalation of tensions. And you would, Lord, intervene that is beyond human abilities. Save us, Lord, from the bitterness of war. Grant us compassion to pray for the souls whatever in need of a saviour, our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray for the church this morning. Our Lord Jesus reminds us to look at the fig tree in the Gospel of Luke. When it sprout leaves, you know that the summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know the kingdom of God is near. We pray that the church everywhere at St. Paul's to watch out for these signs and be discerning of the times. Times of Christ's return. And Advent will herald hope and salvation even as we feel the weariness and challenges of this life. We pray as wise virgin prepared for the bridegroom and as wise steward investing for the kingdom that we wholeheartedly as a church watch for the second advent of Christ for our redemption draw near. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayers. We pray for the church community at St. Paul's. We pray that the Spirit will infuse us with a heart of prayer and intercession. Lord, give your church the earnest and urgent see in our prayers that we daily pray so that our prayers have depth, that we daily pray so that our prayer has consistency. We pray, Lord, teach us how to pray. Pray also, Lord, the Spirit will infuse in our church, Spirit of hospitality and fellowship in Christ so that we will know Christ more and more and be the gospel bearer and our souls will be sanctified and our hearts be transformed to righteousness away from evil. And finally, we pray for comfort and healing among us who suffer in mind, body and spirit. Remember Linda Milner, Lynette Sia, David Lowe, Jonathan Kasim, Ellen and He Chai, those homebound, those known to us. We give thanks for God's grace, hope and healing and the persevering faith of these, our brothers and sisters. Merciful Father, accept these, our prayers for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Shall we stand together as we share the peace? We are the body of Christ, in the one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Let us then pursue all that makes for peace and builds up our common life. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Yeah, we share the peace with one another.